Thank you, GoToMeeting. Welcome. We are back with Takesha Jefferson. And I want to say, is, is it still JT Sheree Photography? Or are you doing it a is. different? It is. Okay. Same. So I met Takesha through the My Sisters and Me Collective via Black, girl, Black female photographers and eventually met her in person at the Dallas meetup for Sisterhood of the Traveling Lenses. Yes. And let me ask you, how did you get started with photography? And how long have you been a would you consider yourself to have been a photographer? I started photography, well, um, I want to say I was probably around 12 years old where I started to kind of get my niche with taking pictures. Mm -hmm. And it is not the normal story. I tell the story because it's the truth. Okay. Um, but my sister... My sister used to cry a lot and I love her to death, but she knows this is what the story is. She used to cry a lot. And I was like, I have to document this because when she gets older, I need her to know what my childhood was like. So every <laughs> time she would cry, I would photograph it. And wow. she just, when she would have a fit, because she was having fits. It wasn't like she was crying because she was sad. She's having fits. So I documented that. And literally, if you go back and look at our photo albums now, like all of her faces <laughs> are the fits that she's having. Because I was like, dude, you're doing too much. Um, and so then I started to pose her and my stepbrother. So during happier times, the pictures are horrific. But I, there was a love. You could see I was trying. <laughs> they were so far away. And like, so like superposed. Um, <laughs> there was usually always a tree um, in the background, but I, there was a love and I was trying, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's important. You know, I think sometimes as we move forward, we forget the beginning, you mm -hmm. know? Um, so I like to go back and look at the beginning, um, the seed of where my love was starting, you know, to kind of take root. Okay. Um, what, were you using like one of the old 110, 120 cameras? Was it a 35? A hundred percent. A hundred percent. That and Polaroid. Um, okay. I was starting. I, I didn't really have anyone around me that had a love for photography. So I think had I had that, you know, because I wasn't, really wasn't seeing anybody else take pictures. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was kind of just me alone kind of self-fostering. I think in this climate now, you know, with the resources that could be available, you know, maybe that younger Takesha could have blossomed a little bit more earlier. Um, but I ended up joining the military a little bit after high school. And um, I was a public relations specialist. And part of our job, uh, if we couldn't get the base photographers who are also military, uh, to photograph a story for us, we would have to uh, photograph that ourselves. So um, my supervisor allowed me to take the camera home, which I'd like to say um, I was always scared to bring the camera home because it was a digital sat satellite camera. And he mm -hmm. reminded me that it was a $20,000 camera. Now this is in 1996. Yeah, $20,000. And I'm like, oh, I'm supposed to take this home to practice with? Well, to the door, you know, a horn. But um, I definitely uh, <laughs> started. To, <laughs> I started to practice, and so some of my uh, friends and doormates would. We had a um, a dorm that just had, got torn down next to us, mm -hmm. and so I love, which I've never stopped loving. I love debris. I love things that don't look like people would want to photograph there. Like that's normally when I'm like, ooh, <laughs> and I get excited. And so I took a chair in the middle of the area of where um, the construction was, where there was no yellow tape. There was no yellow tape. <laughs> and so we went and I photographed and I really started to fall in love with the face. Okay. And I got closer and closer and closer. And I was, I had the pictures up at my, um, my job and my supervisor was like, oh my God, who took those? I was like, me? I was like, why don't you do this for the paper? <laughs> it's like, because you guys don't let me. But uh, but no, so I would say I really started to kind of get my wings and see who I was a little bit more there. But honestly, probably around the time I met you all, um, okay. you know, with the uh, My Sisters and Me um, 
and you know, I want to say probably 2009 ish, 10. I did have a photography business right around 99 in Florida. It was called Jefferson Photography. It was me and my husband. We were doing weddings. Okay. Um, but even then, I, I hadn't found me within my photography. I think a lot of photographers, sometimes we just think we're supposed to shoot what everybody else is shooting. Right. You, just, you just take your camera out. Because you're a photographer, you can photograph anything, right? Everybody calls you, you're a photographer, come shoot this. Mm -hmm. um, I hadn't really honed in on what was for me. And I was on the plane flying somewhere once. And I got kind of a little irritated because of the way that uh, the stewardess was like pushing my camera bag in the top. She was smushing other things around it. And I, I just kind of pulled it out. And so a gentleman two seats away from me noticed, he's like, oh, you're a photographer. And I'm like, yeah. Um, he was like, well, can I see your work? And I had my iPad. I'm like, oh, yeah. And he was like, oh, you're a portrait photographer. Mm -hmm. And I said, huh? Because <laughs> I'm, I'm just a photographer. What do you mean? He was like, no, you're a portrait photographer. You shoot mm -hmm. portraits. That's what, that's what you are. I'm like, no. And then I start looking at my portfolio and I'm like, oh my God. It goes back, you like faces. I'm a portrait <laughs> photographer. <laughs> I really am. I do focus. Hold on. I lost you a little bit. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can. He was saying that uh, you're a portrait photographer and you realize after looking at your work that you were a portrait photographer. A hundred percent. It was like he put a, a mirror up to myself. I was actually able to see me by him seeing me. It was the weirdest thing ever because I did not realize until that moment that I was a portrait photographer and that yes I love the face I love eyes I prefer more non-smiling pictures um mm -hmm. because and not that I'm not saying that my subject isn't happy I just prefer their eyes to tell the story okay you know and than I've just watched, a forced smile yeah and I've watched your photography evolve right so you've done you get very creative with your edit. So it's not just a straight like a color correction and things like that. You get very artistic with your edits. So much so that I've seen it develop over time. You still do portraits. You still do what I would call some fashion photography. For a minute there, you had a bit of a, a digital magazine going. I don't know if it's still going. We, we were in the process. We've merged two magazines together. So okay. we had two separate magazines. And now they're one. So it's Notoriety, no, Notoriety Magazine. Um, we were supposed to launch April 1st <laughs> uh, with uh, combining the magazines together. Um, right now, we've been using the platform to really spotlight education for uh, children right now that don't have access uh, to schooling. And, mm -hmm. and so we've kind of pulled away from, and, and don't get me wrong, part of the magazine was to encourage education. We're all about, and this is, somewhat of a sidebar, but um, it's for young adults, uh, probably up into around 21 and starting with uh, children around five. But we wanna encourage children that are entrepreneurs, um, who are you know people who volunteer, uh, children who um, are really um, influential within their community as far as education. Um, and just in my, my children, mm -hmm. I think have, kind of taken root there themselves, whether it's one loving math or one loving science or one loving art. I kind of like where kids are able to just blossom where they are um, versus where we try to put them sometimes. <laughs> um, and just celebrating, celebrating children in um, multiple fields. So that's what um, the foundation of the magazine is. But because of where we are um, right now in our nation or the world, um, I thought that it would be better suited that we just kind of push forward. So when parents do kind of float over to the page, they see all free um, resources that are available to them to help educate their children. Okay. So it's not lost on this, you know, the stay at home. Yeah. So you did have some work that was recently featured in the museum though. Your veil series. I do. You about veil series. I have for quarantine exhibitions. <laughs> so um, currently, so that's for uh, 2020. Um, my first, I believe, was at the Monmouth uh, Museum in New Jersey, which is a part of my build series. Um, another is, two were in Alabama, at Alabama State. 
um, which I was really excited about. Um, and that was a partnership also with a local art organization that um, is there called 21 Dreams, who is awesome uh, for spotlighting um, artists um, there. And then the other is in Maryland at Ann Sculpture and Gardens. It's in Solomon's Island. And that one is a Smithsonian affiliate. I had to really go into my brain to pull those out. Um, but my, my build series is, I want to feel like um, a sister to my African-American birthright series. Okay. Um, I followed kind of in the footsteps, or not directly in the footsteps, but I had an appreciation for Sally, Sally Mann's work, right? And Sally Mann, her initial body of work, um, that she was known for was documenting her children. When I was in school a few years back, um, my professor um, had us watch a documentary about her. And at the same time, I felt like, okay, like this is my like sister in photography. I am also documenting my children. So I didn't start documenting my children with her. I was already doing so. And, and seeing someone who was kind of mirroring, you know, what I was doing, it, you know, excited me. Mm -hmm. um, strangely enough, my professor actually told me the next semester that he did not want me to photograph my children <laughs> anymore. Um, mm -hmm. He wanted to kind of see my work branch out of that. Yeah. He says, I want you to challenge yourself. He says, like, I know you can photograph them. And I was just like, you're the one that showed me Sally Mann. Like, you just did that. <laughs> and now you're telling me I can't be Takesha Jefferson. Like, because mm -hmm. I, I felt like in school, like, I wanted to kind of really enrich myself with what I was doing. And, it, and if I shoot my kids, that's what I do. And that's part of a major part of my body of work. Um, but if I go back to the Veiled series, part of that was so many levels of veiling. Um, mm -hmm. And so where you would see physical veils in a lot of the images, some mm -hmm. pictures had no veils um, mm -hmm. that you could see with your eye okay. or, or that you did not realize you were seeing with your eye. Right. Mm -hmm. So I would take my niece where I just recently I started to with my series to reach outside of my four children, my two so daughters and my two sons and photograph my nieces, my nephews, my mother, my grandmother, my aunts and my uncles. Cause I felt again, these are people who are part of my DNA line, which is a major part of uh, my African-American birthright series. And I took my nine year old niece and made her look 70. Whoa. So I when think, you look at pictures, I think I remember you, seeing it. Yeah. One of the one of the recent pictures I did, a lot of people don't realize it's my daughter who's 15. She probably looks about 68. You know, like she's had a hard life in mm -hmm. pictures. And they assume this is an older woman, but it's actually my daughter. Now I have an aunt who is almost 70. And in a picture you would think she was about 13. And so what I was doing in that is paint, you know how sometimes in your family, you'll see like a seven year old and people be like, oh, that look like that. He kind of look like Uncle Billy, you know, mm -hmm. or you see an aunt and she looked like Aunt Esther, you know, or yeah. something like that. And I find that we look a lot alike and sometimes it's just the eyes or just the nose or just the lips. But with some digital fun, um, mm -hmm. I'm able to spotlight. Uh, those pieces. I actually had one of my first cousins who I talked to on a regular basis call me after I posted a picture mm -hmm. because she wanted to know if it was her daughter. She wasn't sure. Her daughter. She was like, is that Indy? I'm like, no, that's Aunt Kita. <laughs> and it was just, that's just how much they looked alike. And a lot of people thought it was Indy. My mother couldn't recognize my daughter in a picture mm -hmm. she didn't know it was my daughter like she went through everybody and I'm like my my it's Leo <laughs> and then again same you know Leo not recognizing my mother and but I love the beauty of the veiling because it allows you kind of to look deeper um I know when I got into my artist statement you know I just want to kind of pull people back from automatically judging what they see or who they believe someone to be and who they are um and just kind of pulling back the mini veils, you know, that we have, you know, some of it just being our skin, you know, when you deal with colorism um, and I, in my family, we kind of, 
I want to say my generation is the first generation of brown. You know, um, and I know it sounds. No, I can see that because I remember you showing me pictures. Yeah, we were, yeah, we, so, yeah, yeah. So I'm I was the the brownest when I was born, and but now this next generation we brown brown now. But mm-hmm. um, but when you look at you know I know uh, when a lot of people meet my mother they're surpri- they're like that's your mom. Mm-hmm. Yes, are you my mom? Dog? Like, oh my know. gosh, yeah, they're like, Are you sure? It's all genetics, people look at our facial features, we are related. <laughs> I mean, and it's so crazy. And so, with that being said, just a little tweak you can see it. Um, like, so for people who look at my work, if you look at my youngest daughter, Lael, and my oldest son, Oshan Jr., they look a lot alike, oh, but yeah, because Lael has a hazel, you know, green eye and she's lighter complected than him, some people don't see it off. But if I just kind of dial my black and whites, mm-hmm. oh my goodness, they look so much alike. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, sometimes you have to look past what you think you see. So and you so. shoot. So with that, you you mentioned the colorism conversation, right? Mm-hmm. The colorism conversation. Do you find? And I know you went to you went to school because you 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 shot. And then you went to school, but you have been shooting and putting work out into the world for years before you went to school for it. A hundred percent. Yeah. Do you find now having done the educational piece and knowing what you know and knowing what you've learned, it kind of shifts who you choose to shoot? Okay. Can can I answer two questions and kind of lean into your, okay. Let me say why I went to school first. Okay. I found that in some social settings, if you hadn't gone to school, you were looked at differently Mm -hmm. because you didn't have education. And I think I have an amazing body of work before I even touched foot on campus, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I had my dreams, my creativity. They were there before I went to school. I went to school because I wanted a piece of paper that said I had a photography degree so that I could go in there where people kind of like really, you know, had their nose up, you know, about those of us who did not have our photography degree, you know, as if we weren't um, just as talented. Right. I remember when I didn't shoot out of auto. And let me tell you, my auto pictures were bomb. Okay, so (laughs) anyway. (laughs) Because I was like, you're shooting a manual and your photos look like crud. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, because again, it's like, okay, you can shoot on manual, but do you have a concept? Do you have a vision? What are you photographing? Um, yeah. And I don't get me wrong. I get the purpose of learning it and I respect it. I just mm-hmm. wasn't liking the snubbing coming mm-hmm. from people who knew how to shoot in manual um, and would diss the people were shooting in auto or didn't know that people were shooting in auto let's go there everybody not telling you what they doing Mm -hmm. all right um so um i went to school got upset that i had to take painting got upset that i had to take art history was upset (laughs) i had to take math right like (laughs) why why do i have to take all these classes i just want to be a photographer Mm -hmm. and painting if you think about my body of work now think about my veil series yeah. That's art history. That's all art history. <laughs> art history just like choked me. Okay. It was like, you love us, Takesha. Right. I remember sitting in that class though, art history one and two, and not really seeing myself. Mm-hmm. Really ever. I'm like, did I not exist? Am I not here? So that's why a lot of my body of work resembles you know, some Victorian-esque style pieces. Because I'm like, I want to see me. I want to see my ancestors. What would we have looked like? I know we existed outside of chains. Mm-hmm. Where, where's, where's, my, where's my history? Mm-hmm. You know, and so I'm trying to pay homage, you know, through the body of work that I produce there. So as far as though choosing who I shoot, everybody's not your client. <laughs> um, so I do try to make sure people have seen my work, mm-hmm. 
you know, before they want to photograph with me. Um, I don't really work with people who are, I call them stranger clients. So they don't know someone who knows me. Uh, Because I have found, I have found nine times out of 10, a stranger client and me don't work well together because they're going to want something from me that is not me. Yeah. And I'm really in a space where I just want to be me. Mm-hmm. And if you see someone else's work that you like, it's probably better that you find that photographer to produce yeah. that body of work for you. You can fly to them or, you know what I'm saying? Like go to them. They, they're they here. They exist and yeah. they could probably do that for you instead of me trying to emulate someone else. Um, yeah. So I kind of try to stick in, in that wheelhouse right now. Um, when I started 2020, it was the year of exhibitions um, and the year of me working, like, just on my writing and things like that. So this year, I'm trying not to shoot clients um, okay. because I really want to work on uh, my exhibitions and my uh, body of work that way. But college did help me more so because of the connection to the other students mm. and being able to vibe with other creatives. Um, I think, like, that would be my recommendation to anyone um, within whatever industry they're in is to surround themselves with like-minded people. When I say like-minded, they don't have to be portrait photographers. Mm-hmm. You can hang out with a landscape photographer, a food photographer. Um, it definitely can open your, your mind up to other, other things. Um, working with people in theater, I'm looking at costume designs because I'm like a bigger wheelhouse. I do, you know, my background, you know, I do the makeup within reason. Um, I remember when we would go on those thrift store runs and you would find things that you could use for shoes. Let me tell you, COVID <laughs> messed up my thrift in Jesus' nose. <laughs> I have more wardrobe mm-hmm. than I have clothes for me. I believe it. I do. I and that doesn't include what I have in storage. No, because whenever I would go thrifting for you, you were never looking for you. You were always looking, oh, this would look good on this kind of shoot. I've got this little nugget in my head. This will look good on this kind of shoot. And I'm like, is she Girl, by? let me tell you, I got a thrift store here. Ma'am, <laughs> ma'am, there is one. There is one. I'm not even going to tell where it is because I'm not sharing like that. But on, I'm not even going to say what day because then people, good Googlers will find it. But <laughs> there's a store where I was excited at first because Salvation Army's here in the Southeast region on Fridays and Saturdays have dollar days, right? So on Saturday and Sunday, and again, these are for people who are looking, you know, for wardrobe, especially because I am looking for pieces that look the period, you know, that I'm trying to shoot. Um, I can get five for a dollar. So if blue tags are, if you get five blue tags, they're a dollar each. Got to be careful. Don't get four, don't get six. If you get six, the five or four dollar, that six one is whatever full price it is. I thought I was doing amazing. I'm spending twenty, forty dollars racking up, right? Um, then I found another store that was five, five for a dollar of the color tag. And I'm talking about ball gowns, prom like <laughs> dresses. And I'm using this stuff for material. Now, for people who think, you know, oh my gosh, she's buying up everything. I <laughs> When I buy like the prom dresses, mm-hmm. I will loan them out to girls who need them. Okay. Nine times out of 10, I'm not gonna cut the prom dresses. Um, and so any girl who needs a dress, my daughters know people in the area, wherever I reside at that time, know that if they need a dress and then if the dress is ruined, nine times out of 10, they're not, my feelings aren't hurt. This I either paid a quarter or a quarter or a dollar. Yeah. And I mean, I'm talking about A1. They're amazing. The last shoot I did with my daughter, uh, the wedding dress that I did her in, it was $20. And that broke my heart to spend that $20. Um, but uh, it was the beating on it was gorgeous. And again, I think that's something else that can help um, with, you know, the way that my end piece, like you were saying, in my photography is with a lot of the things that I've been doing with the Veil series, I'm emulating um, a wet plate type um, a photograph. And so, you know, it may be 20 to 30 layers, um, mm-hmm. on it. It's a funny one. I print They're like, are you sure? <laughs> and I'm like, 
<laughs> like, yes, I want it to look like a glass of water, like, mm-hmm. fell on my piece. I'm actually thinking about taking and printing the pieces where there's some level of texture to it, and then I mm-hmm. actually start to, quote-unquote, destroy the image on purpose and leave it out to see what it looks like and then Hmm. frame it after that so like that's next step yeah yeah because you imagine like a pictures coming out of a fire you know what i mean and things like that or flood damage because that's Hmm. a lot of people's story like how do you save that piece and not restoring it though Mm -hmm. it's like remnants don't nobody steal that that's mine i just said it copyright patent pending (laughs) <laughs> trademark whatever <laughs> so a wrap up question um, a wrap up question and I'm going to leave you a chance to say what you may have wanted to say that I didn't get a chance to ask about when I met you you were shooting Nikon but you also had a Canon I did. I did. where are you now what are you shooting? I know I thank you for calling me out about this um, <laughs> again I have no home. I always mm-hmm. used to say Nikon was my husband and Canon was my boyfriend. Um, <laughs> I, I will say this is what I believe. Mm-hmm. Most people shoot with a body because that's where they bought their lenses. Mm-hmm. Right? And they stick with that body because that's where they have their lenses. I kind of had both bodies and a lens both at the beginning. I was Mm -hmm. gifted a camera and then I had a camera and I I, I had like a few lenses for each. And again, these were not the Coupe de Gras cameras again, because you know, camera snobs, I'm not one, but I have currently a $300 camera to a $4,000 camera. Okay. I have a range and um, I've had exhibitions with photographs that have come from both the $300 camera and the $4,000 camera. And if anybody wants to take the time to try to figure out what picture was taken, oh, actually, let me go deeper. Let me just tell all my business. <laughs> I've, had, I've had an exhibition with a photograph I took with my iPhone. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yes, she did. <laughs> yes, she did. And that one was at the Smithsonian Affiliate. Uh huh. <laughs> so for all those people saying you must have a nice camera, people, it's not the camera. It is. I mean, don't get me wrong. There's some glass that's nice, okay? Oh, yeah. And there's mm-hmm. some clarity within that glass. But I ain't even had that glass yet. The most expensive lens I had was my 85, right? Mm-hmm. And my daughter dropped it. What? Which one? Which one? Ty I Lear. Ty Lear Amari Jefferson. That's so who when- did it get back to the DC area I have permission to shake her yes yes <laughs> but when she dropped it she just picked it up like she didn't drop it she wasn't even gonna tell me though oh, no. oh, Jesus. I was so hurt but you know what I love my daughter more and I always told my kids that I love y'all more I had to take a breath because I didn't want her to self beat up because yeah. I knew she felt bad it wasn't on purpose it was an accident that would have been different that would have been different it She's was an accident, and I always tell my kids when it because they do it. And I see, I had a butter dish that was crystal. Andre broke that. I took a <laughs> breath. Wax, <gasps> wax. I'm not. I love you more. I love you more. But um, as far as the cameras, I still have both bodies. Okay. I have a lot of Canons, a lot of Nikon's, and um, I shoot with both. And again, I'm not a camera snob. I know when I went, um, I wish I could tell you the name of the conference I went to a few years ago. It was in New York um, and actually held it at the Javits Center. Um, Mm -hmm. It's one of the bigger um, photography conferences. It's photographer something. Um, But nevertheless, I was there and I went on a photo walk and I brought the expensive camera and the, you know, the light camera. I like to call it light because it's not heavy. Okay. Mm -hmm. And when we went on the photo walk, I took my $300 camera and a lot of photo snobs were eyeballing me. Oh, I don't care. Like, I'm like, but I'm here. Mm-hmm. Y'all worried about this camera, but I'm here. Amazing. Mm-hmm. I mean, can we go back to what people used back in the day? Hello. Like, it's, sometimes you have to include yourself as the part of the equation. Like, I matter. 
Mm -hmm. My I, my ability to compose matters. Right. So you're telling me if all the photographers of the world had a $300 camera that they couldn't go out and kick butt? Look, it's funny because everybody likes to push full frame. And I won't lie. Um, my last Nikon before I switched to the Sony was the 750. It was a full frame and I loved it, but it was too Sports. heavy. It's too right. heavy for conference work. So I sold it and got the Sony. Right. And it's full frame and I love it, but I don't like the battery life. I just don't. And right. people are going to be like, I already said that in the other interviews. And I'm going to say it in every interview. I'm tempted to see if Nikon is willing to come out with a lighter weight DSLR because I will absolutely. I'll keep my Sony for walkarounds, but I will go back to a DSLR if they give me a lighter version of it. I do. I, I agree with that because I have, okay, I'm right-handed, but mm -hmm. I don't know if you've probably seen, you've had to see me do it because you've shot with me. Yeah. When I'm shooting larger events, I have more than one body on me at a time. I shoot mm -hmm. with two to three cameras on my body, you mm -hmm. know, you know, and so with that, I will pull up two cameras at a time to shoot with. You know mm -hmm. where I've, I've mastered that but because of i don't know how it happened but in my left wrist i have a ganglion cyst it's a beautiful mm -hmm. word ganglion <laughs> but my, 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 my <laughs> it is yeah, it is and so my wrist is weak now um mm -hmm. and i can't always do things with it and so i'm not trying to have anything happen with my right hand mm -hmm. you know so i'm trying to be very mindful of that and as age you know, happens. There's just some natural things that happen. So I do prefer a lighter camera. So I hope they hear you. Um, mm -hmm. I would definitely love a lighter body. And so I'm like, like, no shade. I'm for whoever wants to photograph with what they have living their mm -hmm. best life. Yeah. Okay. And then if you have the ability to go up, but I just need people to stop judging people because they're shooting with what they had access to and what they could afford with. And trying to make this person think that they don't have the ability to shoot masterpieces with those because they can. I've seen some artwork that came like, out of the five. That no, looked came like, out it looked shoot. Well, and that was the other reason I wanted to do this series too. And I mentioned, I have a vlog going up soon that talks about why I'm doing it. Whenever okay. I do a series, I always find like men photographers, usually white men, but here lately, I've seen it in the crafting community. I've seen it in the quilting community. And now I'm seeing it more and more in the photography community. If you search, I want to see what, you know, what's a good lens for a Sony? Is an off-brand lens better? Because sometimes an off-brand lens can be just as good. Okay. And a lot of YouTube pages putting up lens reviews, but they feel like 10-minute commercials. Like they got, you can tell they got paid to push oh. this lens. I'm just like, can right. you can somebody just give me an honest to God opinion about how this lens performs? And you didn't get a kickback or a free lens or right. a financial sponsorship. Just be honest, and you can't. Right. It's hard. Authentic. It's just pure. You just said something that reminded me, and it's, it's a really short story. But I went to Michaels mm. to get one of my pieces framed, or actually three of my pieces framed for an exhibition. And I had my pieces, my prints, there in the store with me while mm -hmm. I was looking. And an employee walked up to me. And um, he looked at my work. It was my Veiled series. Mm -hmm. Okay, I just need, you know, and so the pictures that I sent to you for this are from my Veiled series. So to just make reference that people would be able to see that. Mm -hmm. um, but he asked me, after looking at my pieces, this is white man. He asked me, was my body of work black empowerment? Yeah. That's the same face I tried not to make in the store because I didn't understand how my veiled series gave off any. Well, not that not that I I'm not woohoo. But this was not what the picture looked like. Okay? It's it's and, one of those I don't want to call it accidental racism, but it is accidental ignorance that something that is considered Victorian or dated and not linked to enslavement would automatically be considered empowerment. Ma'am, all I thought was <laughs> if a Caucasian photographer had walked in and photographed her daughters in the same mm -hmm. genre that I had done mine, would he have asked her if mm -hmm. her, that her body was white empowerment? Was she celebrating yeah. her whiteness? And I thought not. 
I didn't mm-hmm. like it. It took me a second. Um, I just really, because I kept looking like, how? But like you said, it's because they didn't look like slaves mm-hmm. in that era. Mm-hmm. That I, I freed them in these pictures. <laughs> just like, what is this? What is this? Make it um, make sense. <laughs> right. I, I do hope, I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe that is part of what I'm doing. And again, that wasn't the point that I wanted him to see. I am attempting to free us, right? In the African American body series, I want people to see us outside of change. I want people to literally see us, look at me. And so you will see most of my subjects are looking dead at you. They're looking Mm -hmm. above you, at you, or down at you. Like, Mm -hmm. value me, you know, acknowledge me. I'm here. So I think that's that. (laughs) Anything else you want the viewers to know before we sign off? Um, Live your best you. Be you. Be authentically you. Um, And don't let anybody stop you because you're starting with what you have. You know, acquire what you can as time moves on, but don't let anybody dim your light. Not everybody is going to like what you do. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it'll be the people closest to you, people you love. Um, And that's fine. You know, I always talk about food. Everybody in the house doesn't eat the same thing, doesn't like it. You can be, you know, making your plate and somebody walks over and says, ugh, and you love what you're eating. You're most likely still going to eat your food because, you know, because this person just snubbed you. Continue to create. Mm-hmm. If it edifies you. There was a guy I would watch, um, an African-American street photographer, and he couldn't do photography to sustain his family. It wasn't making enough money um, to take care of his family, but he said it was still necessary for him to photograph. So mm-hmm. it was something he did for, you know, a hobby, his love and his passion. So even if this isn't something, whatever your, your creative piece is that can sustain your family, find a way to do it because it'll edify you. You know, there's a happiness, you know, um, that it'll bring you. I tell people all the time, my drug is art. Mm-hmm. My therapist is Hobby Lobby. Well, it was, I ain't going to them right now. Um, and Michael's and, you know, the other craft stores. I go in there and I'm like, ooh, what am I going through today? <laughs> Will I not buy up the whole store? It helps me just release so much to be able to tell um, the stories through my art. So I just encourage people to art in whichever way um, they can, which, with whichever lane it is for them. Just be happy, especially now. Oh, especially now. But thank you so much for your time. Thank you.